Welcome, welcome, welcome. I am Manoj Partisani. I'm the Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs uh, for Hunter College. And it is my honor and privilege to be here at this event and welcome all of you. I also want to welcome our esteemed panelists today that you will be hearing from. We're very excited and honored that they're all here. Um, oh, thank you to all of you who are in attendance here and on Zoom. And of course, I would be amiss if I did not thank the wonderful administrators, staff, and volunteers of Centro uh, who do this amazing, incredible, pioneering work that has put Centro on the map, not just here in New York City, but across the world. So we're very excited at this event. I was especially honored and excited when Centro asked me to uh, offer welcoming remarks because I found out that Antonia, An Antonia Pantoja was a social worker. I am also a social worker by profession. So like-minded people. <laughs> so, and that's why I'm so excited. Um, Antonia Pantoja received her bachelor's degree from Hunter College in 1952. She then earned a master's degree in social work from Columbia University in 1954 and a doctoral degree from the Union Graduate School in Ohio in 1973. Uh, Dr. Pantoja began to attend Hunter College first on scholarship to complete her baccalaureate degree and then returned to her work as a designer at the Lamp Factory she had worked at prior to graduating. It was at Hunter College where Dr. Pantoja made additional connections with Puerto Ricans born stateside and where she began to familiar, uh, familiarize herself with issues at the forefront of their concerns. Dr. Pantoja was fortunate enough to locate like-minded Puerto Ricans who demonstrated an interest in meeting together in order to discuss the social factors determinants of the Puerto Rican experience in New York. Gathering initially in Dr. Pantoja's living room and later on in a space at the Good Neighbor Community Center on 106th Street, this group of in individuals, which included Antonia, Hunter College students Martha Valley, Maggie Miranda, Sandra Canino, as well as employees of the Migration Division of the Department of Labor of Puerto Rico, such as Charlie Cuevas, Jose Morales, and Paul Caballero. They discussed questions related to the representations of Puerto Ricans in the media and the ways they were perceived and perhaps stereotyped in the broader community. Antonia was a true social worker at heart a passionate, fearless advocate for several issues. She was a change agent, she was a thought leader, she was a community leader, and she was a builder of institutions. She was instrumental in founding the Hispanic Young Adult Association in 1953, later became the Puerto Rican Association for Community Affairs, uh, Aspira, the Puerto Rican Hispanic Leadership Forum, later called the Puerto Rican Forum, Adelantes Boricuas, Puerto Rican Research and Resources Center, Boricua College, and Producer Incorporated. She was a faculty member at the School of Social Work at Columbia University and also at San Diego University. She was appointed to the Bundy Blue Ribbon Panel for the Decentralization of New York City Public Schools by Mayor John Lindsay, to the, Commissioner, to the Commission on Undergraduate Education and the Education of Teachers. And she was most important, she was a recipient of several honors and accolades and richly deserving uh, awards during her lifetime. But she was also a recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1996. She is truly continues to be a role model and an inspiration for all of us that come after her on how to lead our lives and how to give back to the community. So it is my honor to open this event and invite the next speaker onto the podium. Thank you, everyone. Bienvenidos todos to Silberman School of Social Work at Hunter College. 
My name is Lindsay Whitworth, the Digital Archivist at Centro, the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, the largest university-based research institute, library, and archive dedicated to the Puerto Rican experience in the United States. As we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the land politically designated as New York City to be the homeland of the Lenape, Lenape Hoking, who were violently displaced as a result of European settler colonialism over the course of 400 years. Antonia Pantoja is a leader in the community development and a key figure in the founding of several seminal Puerto Rican institutions. Best known for the inception and creation of Aspira, Pantoja was dedicated to the self-determination of the Puerto Rican community. Tomorrow would have been her 100th birthday and Centro, in collaboration with Aspira of New York, the Hunter College AFPRL Department, BronxNet, the LGBTQ Policy Center at Roosevelt House, and the Antonia Pantoja Centennial Group are excited to be here today to pay tribute to this powerhouse in our collective history. Dr. Antonia Pantoja was born on September 13, 1922 in the Puerta de Tierra section of San Juan, Puerto Rico, and passed away on May 24, 2002 in New York City. She was an educator and activist who is in the forefront of promoting positive images of the Puerto Rican community by increasing, edu increasing educational opportunities on the Puerto Rican archipelago in New York City and beyond. Dr. Pantoja was instrumental in the founding of numerous organizations throughout her life, was, but was perhaps best known for founding Aspira in 1961, which is a nonprofit organization that promotes advancement in education and leadership for Puerto Rican and other Latino youth in New York City, New York State, and other locations in Connecticut, Delaware, Florida, Illinois, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Puerto Rico. In 2002, Dr. Pantoja donated her archives, documenting her prolific life's work to the Centro Archives, where it lives alongside numerous related collections of organizations such as Aspira of New York, and Aspira of Washington, D.C., as well as the collections of numerous collaborators, such as Alice Cardona and Evelina Lopez Antonetti. Included in her collection is also her Presidential Medal of Freedom, which we proudly display in our reading room. Awarded by President Bill Clinton to Pantoja in 1996, it is the highest civilian honor in the United States. Additionally, she has been inducted in the Hunter College Hall of Fame and received a Professional Achievement Award from the college, an honorary degree from the University of Puerto Rico, and in 2012 was inducted to the Legacy Walk, an outdoor display that honors the history and contributions of the LGBTQ plus community in Chicago, among countless other accolades. We're joined today by those who knew Pantoja best. Lillian Jimenez, director of the film on Pantoja's life, Antonia Pantoja Presente, her life partner, Dr. Wilhelmina Perry, and Dr. Lourdes Torres, with Central Research Associate Jose LaGuerta moderating this conversation on Pantoja's professional and personal life. It is incredibly difficult to encapsulate such a dynamic woman in such a short amount of time, but we hope that by the end of this panel, the subsequent exhibition unveiling, you will understand the evolution of Pantoja's consciousness as a Black and queer Puerto Rican woman, and the subsequent contributions of these identities to her professional development. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Centro Research Associate Jose LaGuarta and our wonderful panelists.
Oh, <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. And I want to thank all of my colleagues at Centro for this wonderful opportunity to really get to know um, at a much deeper level this, this truly uh, powering, right, giant figure, not just for the Puerto Rican community, but for the history of New York City, I mean, for the Puerto Rico in general, right, and, uh, and, and really for the world, and the opportunity to work with these three amazing women who are up here on this stage with me uh, tonight. Um, we, I know we've, we've had some very interesting conversations already over email, so I know that the, um, the discussion tonight should, should really be, be interesting. Um, so without fur further ado then, um, good evening to the three of you, um, and thank you uh, for being here with us. Um, I wanna begin by talking a little bit about Dr. Pantoja as a leader right? um, and as a visionary, as we know, that's um, sort of the subtitle of her, of her memoir, her autobiography. What, what, did it, what, what did leadership mean to her? How did she develop her leadership throughout her career? What about her, um, her work makes her a, uh, a visionary? I know you all shared some really interesting stories that um, uh, would be great for the audience to get to know a little bit more about. So yeah. whoever wants. Oh, um, with me on the stage uh, are, I, I apologize, uh, uh, Lillian Jimenez, Dr. Wilhelmina Perry, <laughs> and Dr. Lourdes Torres. Uh, oh, I'm Jose Laguata. I'm one of the research associates here at Centro. Nice to meet you all. So whoever wants to take the yeah, question. She's our co-moderator. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Um, so, um, you know, I should say that um, Antonia Pantoja, two things about her early period that I think really did influence her as a leader. She was a servant leader. And she really inculcated that in the Aspita students, which was, you know, service to community. But Tony was born um, an illegitimate child in um, um, uh, Puerta de Tierra, Barrio Obrero. And um, she was born with a call over her face. And so for folks who come from the South, you know, when somebody's born with the call, you know that they have second sight. And so she would always say that she was born with the call. And the call is really that the amniotic sac is intact. And the, the comadrona, the midwife, had to break it open or else she would die. So she was always told that she was a special child. Um, because of that. And I think she didn't necessarily have second sight in the way that we think about it as somebody who's sort of psychic and can see things when they look at people. But she did have this ability to look at these young people and be able to see them not for who they were in that moment, but who they could be, and that she could communicate that to them and inspire them to actually be those people. Um, the other thing was that her, her grandmother always used to say, Tonita, Tonita, ven aquí. And, and she would come over, right? Um, and she would say, show them your hands, show them your hands. And um, her grandmother would say to her, you know, Tonita has a special destiny. And so, you know, in the film she says, and I began to believe that, that she had this special destiny. So I think she had this ability to look beyond what was uh, happening in the moment and to see what could actually happen, what could be, not just with people, but when she was in San Diego, you know, Mina said to her, what are you going to buy? We're going to buy this place in this place that is like crud and horrible. And she said, you have to have imagination. You have to have vision. And that's what she had. She had this imagination and this vision of what could be um, and who people could be and confidence that they could actually achieve um, the goal. So she was really a servant leader and she really wanted everybody else to be a servant leader. She was also a collaborative leader. She was somebody who worked with other folks constantly um, working with people. You know, you heard a list of all the organizations. There were people in all those organizations. Um, so yeah, Mina worked with her for 30 years. So Mina, you have a much better take on her as a leader than I do. Good evening. You heard from Lillian a little bit about the how the person who gets presented as a leader. I'd like to talk a little bit about Tony as a person, the person that I lived with for so many years. In spite of all of these accomplishments 
in spite of all of the accolades she received, she was a very humble person, a very uh, simple person in many ways. I was thinking tonight, if she were to know that we were doing this tonight and that we are talking about a school being named after her and a street here in El Barrio being named after her, her reply would be, what's all the fuss about? <laughs> what's all the fuss about? I remember when she received the medal from Clinton and this, she was probably at that time, 70 or so. She said to me, I guess now I'm really a leader. Mm -hmm. So she had all of this capability and these skills to be able to accomplish and do. But she also had this other side of her that was humble. I, I, I can't impress upon you enough the humility. And if you see the documentary, you'll understand what I mean. So that you have a combination of a person who is a kind of little person, like five, three, <laughs> but a person who saw herself as a giant and who lived her life as though she were a giant. She says in the film at one point, I'm full of myself. <laughs> and she smiles and giggles. But that was who she was. And maybe Lourdes. Um, yes, I'd like to add, first of all, I did not know Antonia Pantoja personally. And so all of my knowledge of her comes from uh, reading her um, autobiography and then going to your wonderful archives and um, looking through uh, the materials there because I've written a few pieces about her. And that also led me to be able to meet the two wonderful women here and to share in all of um, their histories and their stories. So that's where um, um, my comments will be from. And from what I've read of, um, of Antonia Pantoja, I, I guess one of the, the things other than what has been mentioned that really struck me as I was reading her work is her commitment to coalition building amongst all different types of people. So she's known primarily as someone who has really contributed to the Puerto Rican community. But she's also someone who recognized that in order for us to move forward, we need to also work in coalition with African Americans, with uh, Asian Americans, with people of all different types of groups. And I think that was a really impactful thing for me to, to understand about her. Another thing I really value about her connected to your question is her commitment to teaching. As you all know, teachers are uh, undervalued and disrespected. And when you look at her life and you look at um, her work leading, being a teacher, creating leaders, because not only was she a leader, but she created generations of leaders, you, I hope, recognize the value of teaching and especially of this type of teaching, of teaching to uh, encourage students to participate in serving their community and all communities. So I think those are things that resonate for me about this question. Wonderful, thank you all. And um, are there any specific stories that you might want to share uh, about her um, leadership uh, capabilities that sort of illustrate that? I know um, that while we were conversing on, on email, these stories of how she organized Las Madrinas and the Bodegueros, came up several times. So would you like to share that with the audience? Um, sure. Um, so, um, you know, Tony was not loved by everybody. Let's be clear. You know, we had all these men who were in control of the politics and the community-based organizations in New York, you know, the few that existed. And so she's a lesbian. She didn't care. She didn't care if they liked her because they were not potential partners for her. So she was like speaking her mind and, you know, all the women would be sitting back and she'd be sitting front and talking with, you know, and giving, you know, sort of holding forth. Um, so I, I think that's a really important aspect of who she was. Um, 
she also was a really comprehensive. So talk about coalition. She was like not a collective. She didn't work in a collective, but she worked in a cooperative manner with folks. And so um, she also had this comprehensive sense of community development. And Mina can actually talk about community development and the way in which it was realized later on in her life in San Diego when they organized the, the, the school in San Diego. And so um, she decided that uh, because the students that she was helping to go to college were extremely poor, their parents were working all the time, they didn't have anybody to take them to college. They didn't have anybody to pay for their books or even for clothes or anything. So she went and started working with um, um, seamstresses people in the community, women, working class women who were in the ILGWU, the International um, Ladies Garment Workers Union. And so she organized them to become this force called La Madrina and they would do fundraising events where they would then raise money and then give the money to the students so that the students could go to college or buy books or whatever. In some cases, um, they were connected to some of the students, you know, they were a family, extended family, whatever they would accompany the students to college because nobody in their family had ever been to college. So these madrinas were really there to help the students be able to achieve their dreams. So that was one group. But then she noticed bodegueros, right? So the, the shopkeepers in um, you know East Harlem and Brooklyn and the Bronx, wherever. And she worked with this guy who's a really interesting character, Johnny Torres. And I think you have the collection, Johnny Torres's collection here. It's really worth looking at. Ese tipo era una persona pero pícaro, así, you know, just like so uh, energetic and funny and dressed fabulously, I must tell you. He was just like the sharpest dresser I ever met. And he asked me to meet him in a hotel, in a hotel lobby. And I thought, well, why does he want me to meet him in a hotel lobby? I want to talk about the metro and the bodegueros. And uh, he said, I designed this lobby. He was a, a lobby designer. Uh, and I was like, what? And so then he organized all these, all these bodegueros um, to organize the metro. And what they did in the metro was like a cooperative. And so they would then be able to purchase their produce at a reduced rate. He would also help them every time they started a new bodega, he would go in and he would design where they should put the produce, where people could reach it easier. I mean, he was just amazing. What an energetic guy. And so she helped him to organize the metro. She also worked with the African-American community um, and getting anti-poverty money. So, you know, anti-poverty money came in because the Kerner Commission said, you know, the reason why there's all these riots is that uh, in 1969 is that um, people are not seeing themselves on TV, but there's also no mechanisms for them to be able to like, you know, develop their communities. Um, and so then all this anti-poverty money came into play and she worked with the African-American community to gain access to some of that money because the African-Americans had started uh, a group to get money from Haryu. Um, and so um, she then got money from the PRCDP and um, so here's where we get to the conflicts in the community. Um, and um, she started the Puerto Rican Forum, right? Which then started ASPIDA, but she also took the lead from ASPIDA to develop the Puerto Rican Community Development um, Project. And it was really about, you know, mass uh, participation of the community. So she invited everybody, even people who didn't like her, who thought that she was, you know, a group of perfumados, people who were too elite, whatever. They were the educated professional sector. And these other folks were much more community based and very progressive. You know, some were socialists, some were Marxists. And so, you know, they had some issues with these, uh, you know, college intellectuals or professionals the perfumados as they called them. And so, um, you know, she's coming out of these meetings and she's a little confused because you had to invite everybody to the meetings. And so then one, she's walking out of the meeting. And so this woman says to her, aren't you going to the meeting after the meeting? And she's like, what meeting after the meeting? And, um, and the woman says, oh, we always have a meeting after the meeting <laughs> where we talk about, where we talk about how we're gonna take over um, this project. And so she's like, really? Oh, I want to go to this meeting. I don't think this woman knew who Tony was. So Tony goes to the meeting and she sits there and she goes like, holy cow, they really are trying to take over this project. And she goes back to the forum and she says, they're trying to take over the project. And so then the, pro the forum decided that they were going to let them take over the project. So Gilberto Gerena Valentin, Evelina eh, eh, Antonetti, eh, Kim, uh, Jose Morales, eh, a couple of other folks, Manny Diaz, uh, people who were progressives, who were doing community-based organizing, 
um, they took over the project and they ran with the money for PRCDP. So Bronx Parents United, which was Evelina's organization, comes out of the PRCDP, but it came out of that tension that was existing with people, you know, had different strategies and different even ideologies and different styles in doing the work. Like Tony was like, I'm not going to fight with these people to keep this money, you know, I'm going to keep going, you know, and doing the things that I do because those are as important. So, you know, um, yeah, those are the anecdotes. She was just an extremely comprehensive person. When I first met her, so this is really funny. When I first met her, my friend introduced me to her and she said, oh, you have to meet this woman on and on. And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, sure. Okay. So I call up and she says, send me your resume. And I'm like, I want to be your friend. Why do I have to send you my resume? And she said, I want to know about you. And I'm like, uh, you can meet me and know about me. And I thought, oh, she's really formal. She's kind of old school you know? And so I thought, okay, fine. I'll send you my resume. Fax me your resume. Okay. I'll fax you my resume. You know, it absolutely changed my life. She became my mentor and I understood why it was. She asked me to participate in the process of creating the book and then being able to do the oral histories and then ultimately doing 17 hours of her oral history and creating the film. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you a funny, every time I'm on a panel with Lillian, I say to myself, this woman knows more about the department than I live with. <laughs> yes. I don't need to be here. Well, oh, least, yes, you do. <laughs> at, least, at least I know the last half of her life. Uh, when Tony left uh, New York City, many people felt that they had run her out because of this conflict that had taken place. And that was a victory for the men, I guess, and some of the women in the community. But actually, when she came to San Diego, she was sick. Her asthma had become so bad, the doctor had said to her, if you don't leave New York, you're going to die. So San Diego was one of the places uh, that he gave her an option to come to. So she came to to uh, San Diego. I was teaching in uh, San Diego State University School of Social Work. And if you can believe it, she came and I was to be her mentor. <laughs> 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 to show you what a good mentor I was, she got tenure in four years, <laughs> early tenure. And she also became the head of the undergraduate program in social work. But we were teaching in the School of Social Work, and we are two of, of the many social workers who found themselves in the concentration of organizing and policy. And even to this day, we're probably 4%, 6% of the profession. So we were always outsiders in our own profession. And when we were teaching in San Diego, what we understood is that the students who wanted to do community, who were interested in the life of the people on the ground, they were considered radical, you know, crazy. Just they didn't belong at social work. So we decided that what we needed to do was to embrace these young people. And we, began to work with them on weekends. And finally, it came to be the Graduate School for Community Development. And we ran the school for 13 years. And here is where I think the holistic, uh, cons the holistic idea that Tony had for working became a reality. The school did community art programs. We had an art gallery, we had theater, we had exhibitions. We did economic development. We tra trained young people how to develop their own small businesses. We also taught research. We taught uh, political uh, economic theory. So it became the development of a total model. Actually, what she was trying to do here in New York but it's very difficult to do it in New York because programs are so uh, separated and funding is so separated. But here we could mm -hmm. do this. And uh, we did it around the United States. We did it with uh, community leaders throughout the United States and also in Puerto Rico. 
we started out how arrogant we are. <laughs> As a degree granting institution, we were to offer the master's and the PhD. We got from the state of California the approval and the license to offer the program. And we were one of the first programs. Now you see community development all over. We were one of the first programs in the nation to develop a program a curriculum in community development. When the uh, people came from the state, it was like, what are these people talking about? <laughs> you know, what are they uh, trying to do here? And here we are, this black and Puerto Rican woman, right? But when they left, they were so amazed at what we were trying to do. They gave us approval immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, we did that for 13 years, and it allowed both of us because I'm, as I was saying earlier, I'm an Afro-American kid who grew up in Holland. But I came from parents who were union leaders and community activists. And imagine how wonderful for me, I meet this woman <laughs> who's got the same sensibilities about social work, about mm -hmm. working in community. And to top it all off, what an exciting personality. And when we, I'm just going to give a little personal. <laughs> when we began to work together, I was a professional. Uh, I have my own reputation in the black community in San Diego. Uh, but when we began to work together, I said to myself, "My nickname is Mina. Mina, you better get yourself together. Or this woman is going to run all over you." <laughs> <laughs> So those of you who know her know that that was a possibility. Uh, so it really, I grew, uh, she grew, and I think we were able to, to grow together and accomplish a lot. Um, you know, when I um, think about her story, one of the things that really stands out to me is what Mina and Antonia did when Antonia when they retired and left San Diego and went to Puerto Rico, they actually ended up um, in a little town by El Yunque called Cubuy, where my mother is from. Oh. And so when I read it in the book, I'd never seen Cubuy mentioned anywhere. I was like <laughs> really impressed, but they went there to retire, but they're such leaders that they were asked by the local um, government, the people in government to help them uh, develop the community. And so because of um, the uh, the um, cooperation and the leadership of Mina and Antonio, they developed uh, community opportunities. They developed a cooperative farm, they, a co-op. They really did help this community organize itself and created all these new institutions in Puerto Rico in this little town and by El Yunque. And I think that's amazing. That's after they retired. So. <laughs> I say in the film, if you know anything about Tony, you know, coming here to retire. Was... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Inspiring that, you know, as we as old people start thinking that um, uh, we don't have a much value, but sometimes, you know, the gifts continue to come forth and the leadership continues to come forth and we need to be respected as we age. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all for those great reflections and anecdotes. Um, I want to move on a little bit towards um, the role of culture in uh, Dr. Pantoja's um, thinking and work. Um, Dr. Perry talked a little bit about uh, how the arts were used uh, at the uh, graduate school, um, but we also know, you know, if we've read the the memoirs that uh, she, she was very invested in using the values of Puerto Rican culture as she understood them. Um, and a lot of that had to do with her upbringing, I believe, and her family and her and even her political views, right? Um, some of the influence perhaps of her grandfather having been a, uh, a union organizer. And so I'd like to also take this question at, or this prompt as um, to, a way of transitioning also towards talking a little bit more about her her politics, right? Uh, mm. Which uh, Lillian mentioned some of the conflicts that um, she she had at, at, at certain points. 
um, with other members of the community, but there were also, I think, or I felt uh, um, learning about her, um, some, some tensions in her own identity as a political actor, right? Uh, and, and sometimes you can kind of, when you're reading her, you can feel her going in different directions and as she tries to figure it out. So I would love to hear uh, what you all have to uh, say about that. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about her, the importance of her grandmother and grandfather. They, they really created a stable um, uh, working class family for her. And, you know, they had, she would always talk about the flowers, the roses that were um, in the garden, just in, uh, on the side of the entrance to the house. And her grandmother taught her the names of all of the plants, all of the flowers. And so, you know, invariably you would ask her, Mira, Tony, ¿qué es esto? And she would say, Esto es una amapola. You know, that's a hibiscus. And, blah, 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 blah. and you would be like, All I asked was the name. And she would be able to give you like all this information. But her grandfather was an organizer and she really, really, really saw the injustices as a very young child. You know, he, they threw, uh, uh, boiling fat on him, lard on him, boiling fat. Um, and he died because of the injuries uh, sustained from that. And then, you know, they became extremely poor and didn't have the same stability. So I think that that shift really um, marked her. And she talked about it. She talked about the fact that she needed to manage the chaos, that that was something that was really important to her, that she did not want to live right in a in a disheveled situation. And so she was going to put order when there was no order. Uh, and she was going to come up with a plan because that was the other part of her genius, I think, is that she always had a plan. She would say, I have a plan. And you would say, oh boy, here we go. Uh, what am I going to do now? Um, so um, I think that when she then decided that she was going to continue her education and uh, do her doctorate, she met up with all these Marxists out in Ohio and they had a profound impact on her. By then she had been around the block a few times. So it wasn't like she was, you know, this neophyte. Um, she was already advanced in her thinking around multiculturalism, around racism. She was pretty clear about that. She by then identified as a black Puerto Rican. Um, and I think that that whole sort of foray into political economy really changed the way that she thought about things. And she always had this very mixed and uh, contradictory feelings about Puerto Rico, which you talked about as a tension. It was this tension where she loved Puerto Rico, but you know, um, she was trapped in the patriarchal traditions of Puerto Rico and she was not thrilled by that. That's why she left. I mean, she said, I, I had to get out there. I was, it was suffocating, you know, and in the film, I put this thing that says life because she was really trying to search out a whole other life. And it wasn't just about the economics or the political or the cultural, it was also about her sexual orientation. And she was just beginning to come to terms because she said at one point to me, I had this best friend and we traveled to New York and I think I was in love with her. And I was like, what? And she said, I think I was in love with her, um, but I didn't know what to do. Um, so she comes to New York and she really finds herself. She is really becoming a Marxist. She's really becoming a socialist. I did not deal with any of this in the film, which is, you know, a regret of mine, but I couldn't deal with everything she did because it was just too much. Um, but she was really an advocate for the independence of Puerto Rico uh, towards the end of her life and participated in some of the tribunals that were held by the independence leaders in Puerto Rico, um, where they talked about getting the Navy out of Vieques because the Navy was using Vieques, an island off of uh, Puerto Rico, to do bombardment and they were using uranium tipped uh, shells to do that. And so, you know, Vieques has one of the highest cancer rates in the world. We're not talking in the United States, in the world because of all that uh, uranium. I can't talk about Vieques because I get very emotional. I went there for the first time and all I could do was cry because everybody I met had cancer. It was just extraordinary. Um, and there were potholes everywhere. So it's absolutely the forgotten island. Um, but she was an advocate for the independence of Puerto Rico. And she even quibbled about the Medal of Freedom. Mina can talk more about that. But she said to me, I, I don't know if I should be accepting this from this country that has colonized my country. You know, I don't know if I should do this, you know. And she really like back and forth about it. And then she said, you know what? I've done all these things. I deserve this. And I'm so happy that she changed her mind because it's made all the difference in the world for people to know that this woman from this working class background, black Puerto Rican, queer woman, you know, got this medal of, and that's the way it was situated in the film. She's a lesbian. It comes out in the film. She's a lesbian. And then she gets the medal of freedom. So she got the medal of freedom for being a lesbian. Well, 
couple of things. Uh, let me say something about the receipt of the medal. What made that all all right for her, when you walk into the hall where the medal is given, you're given um, so, a soldier, or yes. an escort. And the person, mm -hmm. it, oh, when you walk into the hall to receive the medal, you're given an escort and the person is in the service. Well, they gave her the cutest little black uh, soldier who was just about the size as she was. <laughs> so she was just delighted. It made the whole acceptance wonderful. Uh, I can't speak, I'm going to talk a little bit about her political perspective. I can't speak about her uh, political uh, ideas while she was here in New York. I didn't know her then. Uh, and I have heard the stories that she wasn't political, or she was a social worker, and she wasn't political. But when I met her, she was identifying as a socialist, she would go from socialist to Marx the same way I did. <laughs> but we always, throughout all the work we did, we would have periods of reflection and we would ask ourselves, are we being true socialists? Are we living up to what it meant to be a socialist? She was not a, a joiner in, in like a group and I'm not a joiner in a group. Uh, but that was something we would always ask. And at times we would uh, say, well, you know, we call ourselves socialists, but we're living pretty well here. <laughs> <laughs> so she had that consciousness. As Lillian said, going to Union, she had been associated with Marxists. And I, uh, here, helping to set up the School of Social Work at Stony Brook, had been associated with Marxists. So we really had political perspective. Um, uh, um, her politics, I mean, that's yeah, what we, yeah. Yeah. I forget. That's all right, that was it. I just want to say, because I like to say it, because then you say, oh, we didn't know. I'm 88, yeah, I'll be 89 in yeah, December. <laughs> When I, when I, when I, when I hear, oh, they're celebrating Tony's 100th birthday, I say, oh my God, she's so old. <laughs> but then I say, but Mina, you're going to be 89. So <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, we incorporated also in the curriculum of the graduate school a uh, section on economic theories. Mm -hmm. And it was taught by one of her former classmates a socialist. And so the students got this idea that we are not educating you to be capitalists, to be people who develop a leadership role in your community. And then you take, this is not what we are about. So that, that was very, very clear to us. When we went to Kabui, we developed a credit union, which was a collective uh, uh, strategy and we also taught hydroponics mm -hmm. and we organized the farmers into a cooperative. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, one young man who was a graduate of <laughs> UPenn was such a smart ass that he took over the whole yeah. thing. But the point was really to have a cooperative of farmers who could purchase together and sell together. I'm going to stop. Um, one cool story, I think, in, in, in her autobiography is when she talks about going to Nicaragua <laughs> and um, hanging out with all the, um, the, the Sandanistas oh, wow. and working with them and calling Mina and saying, I have to come back here. I'm going to take up arms. I'm going, <laughs> I'm going to join the revolution. And um, I think it was a, one of her students told her, um, "You shouldn't do that. You're uh, you're a teacher. You're that's your place. That is your role in life." And she realized, yes, that is a, a better um, role for me at this point. I think that's really cool. But we, that that impulse, as you say, that tension. What should I be doing? Am I capitulating to capitalism by participating right. in these programs and getting becoming a poverty pimp, getting that money from the government? Should I be doing something more radical? And I, I guess, um, you know, that tension comes through. 
in we, the text. We went to Cuba. And uh, while we were there, we uh, presented the program that we were doing in San Diego. I feel very proud of, about this. And some of the leaders that this was right after the Russians had left. Mm -hmm. And Cuba was struggling with what would be its economy. And they had decided to begin to give opportunities for entrepreneurial activities. And we presented our project. And then a couple of the people that were actually developing policy for the government of uh, Cuba visited us in Puerto Rico mm -hmm. and asked mm -hmm. us, I don't know if you know this, mm -hmm. asked us to come and live with them in Cuba for two years. Mm -hmm. And that was something to think about. We mm -hmm. said, well, we guess we're not such good socialists yeah. as we thought we were because we don't think we want to go to Cuba for two years. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that. If, if I could um, add something to the whole political identity question, because I, I've noticed that um, Lilian has mentioned a couple of times that uh, we're talking about Antonia as a, a, a lesbian and as queer. And um, it, it's, um, I think it's important to recognize that outside of her friends, nobody knew that. You know, it was not something that was generally known. It was not something she spoke out about saying, I'm a lesbian. Mm -hmm. She wasn't out um, protesting um, the discrimination against lesbians. So it, I think it's an, it was an open secret. Like people who were her friends knew about it, but the rest of us who didn't know her did not know about it. And so I think it's really an, a politically important point to own her as a lesbian and to say that out loud and to, as uh, Lillian has been doing, include that in all her other characteristics, all the while recognizing that throughout her entire life, she never once, as far as uh, any public papers or mm -hmm. speeches, came out and said, I am a lesbian. Even in her memoirs, if you read them, it's very indiscreetly woven in. In the last page, the last three words are, uh, I haven't talked about my sexuality in this book, but I own it. Mm -hmm. And I mention it in a few places in this text. But it's not, I mean, she mentions Mina and her relationship, her part. Uh, yeah, she says, I lived with her for these years, but she never says she was my lover. She was my intimate partner. We shared this lesbian relationship. That's never verbally articulated anywhere. And so I think as we look back now, we have to grapple with that. And I know that myself, I had, I, you know, I wrote about this because I struggled. Can I own her as a lesbian hero? I'm a lesbian and I wanted to own her because I really respected her work with Aspira and all the institutions she built. But in all the things I read about her, I never saw once mentioned. And she's a lesbian. And so I think that's a political issue. That's a, 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 a you know, a, a verbally identifying her in such a way. It's something that she did not do throughout her life, but that we can do now because of her partner and because she's owned it and has been very verbal about it. And because she indirectly talks about it in her own autobiography. And Mina often talks about how if she had lived longer, she would have been, you know, leading one of the, uh, gay pride <laughs> um, marches. It just wasn't part of her context to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's interesting. Yeah, I don't know if you want to say anything. That. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Hey, I'm Rustin. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I was attacked actually after she died. <laughs> Obituary in the New York Times mm -hmm. identified me as a partner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I did, member, some members of the Puerto Rican community actually wrote negatively. And, and I was <laughs> the front of that. And I just took the position. She was who she was. She did not claim that. I am an open lesbian. We had a ceremony before she died. Uh, and I will say to you, no, she did not identify as a lesbian or as an activist in the gay community. Mm -hmm. And that 
what can I say to you? And then people kind of push back and were a little calm about it. But people were not all feeling happy about it. Some people were very uh, angry about it, that she had not come out. And some people were angry that we put in that she was a lesbian in the film. Um, so there was a lot of grief about that. You know, why did you have to put that in there? That had nothing to do with her. And I thought, what do you mean it had nothing to do with her? <laughs> <laughs> That's who she is. Yeah, you can't separate that out. So I do want to say one thing. I showed a rough cut, right? I hadn't dealt with it. And I had had conversations with her. I said, Tony, you know, I'm going to have to deal with your sexuality. Uh, what do you think? Blah, blah, blah. And she said, you make the film that you think you need to, you know, you make the film that you think you need to make. Okay, fine. So, you know, I'm still being a little bit of a coward because I know it's not going to be received well, right? So I show this rough cut and this little girl, little girl, I swear to God, she looked like she was 10 years old, right? Oh my God. And Nancy Trujillo, I always say her name because she was so spectacular. So she's like, ten, you know, two feet tall. And she gets up and she goes, oh, was that her daughter in the film? And I'm like, no, that was not her daughter. Oh, well, was she married? And I'm like, no, she wasn't married. And I'm like, uh oh, here it comes. And she goes, was she a lesbian? And, you know, everybody in the room just sort of looks at her and I go, yes. She was a lesbian and she puts her hands, I always say this, she puts her hands on her hips and she said, well, you're not being fair to her. And I was like, what, what? And she said, you're not being fair to her. You're not saying who she is. And I thought, I think I'm gonna die here. I think I'm gonna <laughs> die. And I, I thought, you're right, I am. And so, okay, I'm gonna deal with it. And then all these kids came up to me at the very end and I said, I don't care, tell her high water. I called Mina and said, Mina, we're gonna deal with this because the children are demanding it of us. Well, we're going to do it. And we did it. We did it in the most respectful and appropriate way that we could do it, which was Mina then said she was a lesbian. She was my partner. Um, so uh, Tony had said to me that she wanted, you know, I could say, what was the most important thing you ever did? And she said, oh, uh, I'm going to get emotional. And she said, um, I said, Aspita has always been what you have said, you know, that is the most important thing that you've ever done. And she said, no, no, I want to write a book. I want to write the most important book. And I said, what's that? She said, my life with Mina. And she said, that's the most important thing I've ever done. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. oh, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And she wanted to work with the young people in Aspita who were LGBTQ, yes. but then she got sick. And so she couldn't do it. Um, so I think she was really ready to, to be out and be out and about and working with young people. Um, because she said nobody's taking care of them. You know, nobody. She knew how bad it was. And remember, she was an educator. She started working 1961 at Aspida. And this was a time when, you know, there was no such thing as gay liberation, gay rights, gay marriage, nothing. It was all homophobia. Like, you know, uh, you are uh, despised. You are uh, absolutely, uh, uh, um, you know, a monster. And you're working with children. I mean, even today they're saying you're inculcating them with drag shows. Give yeah. me a break, for God's sakes. But so thing, yeah, it was bad. The thing that Lillian does say in the film, and several people, uh, at least one person, is it the whole network, the whole network of young Puerto Rican uh, people were gay. Yep. Not out. Not, Not out. out. And it's interesting, we showed the film, I, I live in Chicago, and we showed um, William's wonderful film as part of the centennial at, at, where, at where I work at, DePaul University. And so we invited Aspida um, students from across the Aspida schools in Chicago, and we had a, a big class of fourth graders who came to our event at the university and watched the film. And when they, they, it was over, they wanted to know about her relationship with Mina. And we had a great discussion about LGBTQ issues and why she wasn't out at the time and how important it was to recognize that. And these were fourth graders who were bringing this up. So I think that's pretty cool. Absolutely. And, and, and all of this is so crucial. Um, if only we had had her for a few more years to really develop this work with uh, LGBTQI plus youth uh, in the Puerto Rican community and beyond. Uh, I'm wondering how we're doing on time. Uh, should we open it up to the to Q&A or is there time for one more question? No. Let's do one more. Okay, so uh, I was hoping that maybe we could talk a little bit more about um, sort of her her relationship with Puerto Rico, her experiences, uh, the times that she sort of attempted to to return there, um, the moment when she finally 
comes to terms with identifying as a New Yorican, right? All of these are are, are moments um, in her life and uh, in the memoirs where 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 really, um, and I think there are many other moments for me where where you can sort of see her growing as a person as you read and sort of learning and and saying that she's learning um, in, in that moment. So so could we talk a little bit about those experiences and that relationship with Puerto Rico? Um, both of the times that right because there were two times where she attempted to to sort of move back um um you know and how they they shaped her outlook how they shaped the work that she did and so on she had this love hate relationship with puerto rico uh and she felt that all of the things that she had done in the states that there they didn't recognize it and I would say to her, that's not true for me, because if we would go downtown to an office for business or something, the whole office would come out, Dr. Bando is the doctor. <laughs> so I would say to her, what are you talking about? So I think inside herself was the feeling of not being part of the class. She went to Central High School. Uh, those of you from Puerto Rico know Central High School. She was always the poor kid there. She was always the black kid there. She could never go to the dances and the parties. Mm -hmm. So I think she carried within herself this feeling of not being quite worthy or acceptable. I think it was in her head, a lot of it, a lot of it. Uh, but she also contributed to some of the things. And I remember they invited her to write a paper. Oops. Luis Nieves. No, 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 it was. Oh, yes. Rivera. Right. Yeah. <laughs> they invited her to write a paper. And this is a big thing because this is the, the former governor of Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess they expected her to write a praise paper. Mm -hmm. What well, she wrote about the racism in Puerto Rico, <laughs> <Yeah>. the classism, <laughs> the narrowness. So, and it hit the newspaper. So much so that Melo came out and said, well, I think Dr. Pando is a little hard on us. Yeah. <laughs> so she, you know, she also contributed to what I do not think was a big deal. But uh, when the book came out, uh, they knew that she had gotten the uh, presidential uh, medal and they did publicize it with all the newspapers. Uh, but when the book came out, the thing that hit the newspapers over there was she called herself a New Yorker. Mm -hmm. She called herself a New Yorker. That's yeah. a bad, bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> because, but that was like a, a rejection of the island. So, you know, it was like two, two, two things going on. She and them. Yeah, I think that, you know, the, the patriarchy. Um, mm -hmm. So I think the intersection of patriarchy and racism really drove her out of and the class, and it's also a class because you know in Puerto Rico there is this class system, and it's a small island. It's not like in the United States where you know you can hide class or it's diffused out there, right? But in Puerto Rico it was pretty obvious. You had all of these very light-skinned Puerto Ricans who were, uh, and some white Puerto Ricans uh, who were on you know the top level, the top families, and they had their clubs and they had their schools, and and you know everybody knew who they were. Um, and she was not a part of that, as, as Mina says, she was not. And, you know, she would be known as a grifa. I mean, we have all of these terms that we use in Puerto Rico to designate different physiognomies. And so she would say, no, 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 a mí me llaman una grifa, uh, which is not, it's a pejorative. It's not a lovely term. Um, and so, you know, it's a light-skinned person who has African features and kinky hair. Um, and so um, I think that it was that combination uh, where she was not, and she said this to me, so um, this is what I believe, is that she said when she tried to find work as a consultant, the first time she went to Puerto Rico, they wouldn't even let her in the office. I mean, they just ignored her. She couldn't find work anywhere. And that's why she opened the bed and breakfast, her and her partner at the time. 
Yeah, that first, first time she went, she opened the bed and breakfast. And then everybody from New York used to go to the bed and breakfast and hang out in with, with, yeah, in old San Juan with Tony. Um, and then, um, you know, when she went the second time, she had a plan. She was going there to do, you know, to retire. But the minute that she was asked to do something, she already had a plan in place because she had worked with Mina at San Diego where they had created this incubator. Mm -hmm. And it was an incubator, not just in terms of economic development, but of uh, art and culture. So she had a theater group in there. She had a, a, a museum in there. Um, and she tried to work with the Chicanos out in San Diego as well, which didn't fare so well and because, went, and, and what? Went back with that. And they went back with their own money. <laughs> we didn't need jobs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, I think we're all about out of time for the um, panel part of the discussion. Uh, so I would uh, like to open it up to to our lovely audience. Um, how do we do this? Just people. Oh, if you could come up to one of the mics, please. Oh, mic. oh. Thank you for coming because it is hot. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It is very hot. <laughs> I just want to talk about it. I didn't scream. <laughs> Oh, that's better. Okay, is that better? Yeah. Why don't you introduce yourself? Um, um, I'm Maite Junco, and I guess I was a you know a, a friend of Tony at the end, and and um, was just very very lucky to meet her and and Mina. Um, sort of when they returned to New York, I of course knew about Tony Pantoja when they returned to New York after the Puerto Rico retirement for the real retirement. Yeah. I felt um. And um, anyway, it was I was just it was a pleasure then, but it's great to be here as always to hear um the stories. I guess I was in in Alden, I, and I work. My name is Maite Junco, and I work for CUNY for um the central office now in communications and marketing, and and I guess I wanted to bring it back to home here to where we are. Um, and I, we don't I don't hear much about her time at Hunter, and was I love the picture that was in the program for this event of her in standing in front of the Hunter um, building, one of the Hunter buildings. And so, um, and and then saw something about something today, right? About her papers or something. And I, I was a little bit late. So maybe that was not her papers, but a, a little, um, I thought it was about some um, exhibit or something, but sort of that wanted to see if we could connect her a little bit more to where we're here today and to Sandro and to uh, her time at Hunter. Yeah. So, um, she, uh, so there were not a lot of Puerto Ricans at Hunter when she went to Hunter in the 50s. And so uh, they all sort of found themselves together, Maggie Miranda, Luis Nunez, and a couple of other folks. Um, and, and that's actually the birth of uh, the Hispanic Young Adults Association, because they were talking about, you know, uh, the realities of the community. And remember, in the 1950s, Puerto Ricans were seen as the Puerto Rican problem. We were not seen as like, oh, these wonderful people who are coming over, who are bilingual or, or you know, who enrich our culture so much and, you know, have salsa. None of that was happening. So we were the Puerto Rican problem, except when uh, the United States needed people to, you know, pick the produce in the farms. And then they would do these recruitment campaigns to bring people over. So, um yeah, uh, she found all of these people. They talked amongst themselves um, about, uh, remember, she had a bohemian life before she came to Hunter. And that bohemian life really opened her up to, to new ideas and a very different perspective, much more open than she had been because she was still you know, a little bit traditional. So um, when she met these young people, she organized them to uh, start painting a homeless shelter um, it wasn't even called a homeless shelter. It was called a place for bums. I mean, that's the way the language was. And so they painted this place. And then she said, well, I think we have to do something that's a little bit more meaningful than painting this place. And so then they started to talk about, um, you know, how do we create leaders in the Puerto Rican community? Because we don't have very many. And while there were leaders, you know, they weren't as prominent uh, as, as they can, you know, can be seen today. So, uh, yeah, she really started at Hunter College and she saw the discrepancies in the way that the students were treated. So, you know, she already had the experience in Puerto Rico. She already had the experience in the factories that she worked at. 
And then she went to Hunter. She went to Hunter. She was older than most of them. And so, you know, she really helped to organize them to really work in the Puerto Rican community. So, yeah, at Hunter, I think, is where this fervor started to, like, I don't know, fulminate. It sounds like too many Fs in there. <laughs> Just uh, another little tidbit. For the people who know the Silver, Silverman School of Social Work, he was a friend of Tony's, and he was one of the first funders for I see that. And I met him on several occasions with, with her. So. Good evening, everyone. My name is Carmen Cruz, and um, I'm the founder of the Silent Procession, NYC for Puerto Rico. Uh, many of you probably don't know about it, but uh, th that's who I am. Um, and I'm a community activist, et cetera. However, uh, the important uh, issue here is Antonia. And I want you to know that, you know, Manny Diaz, Jose Morales, Leticia Diaz, Maggie Miranda, you know, I was in the midst of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were all my mentors. Mm -hmm. um, I was political to begin with because my father, uh, my family, my father was a, a, a mayor in Puerto Rico. And so I, it's in my DNA. <laughs> but when I'm, I was here in, in New York later in my later late 20s was when I was surrounded by all these people, mm. uh, these mentors, these giants in our community. And, you know, I did meet uh, Antonia in a lot of social uh, gatherings, and I probably met you, but it's so long ago. You know, estoy viejita también, so I forget. <laughs> but my question is, I know that, uh, I, I believe that it was when uh, you and Antonia retired in Puerto Rico. She started a program where young people from New York, um, their families wanted them to learn the, the language, more, com you know, more comprehensively, and also to learn about their culture and heritage. And it was, and I believe that the program that Antonia and you set up, and I forget the name of it, but I remember it because it a long time ago, um, you would place uh, uh, these uh, young people in, in homes and they were able to live with mm -hmm. families and, and get to learn. It, it was a whole cultural type of exchange, I guess, for lack of a better word. And I want to know what happened with that, because mm -hmm. I thought that the, the whole concept of it was so brilliant. And then it just kind of uh, yeah. dissolved. Lillian's going to answer that, because Be I was not before, involved. Before we address the question, I believe we have one more question, and we have just enough time oh. for that last. So okay. why don't we take them both together, and then we can... Uh... Oh, there are Zoom questions as well. Oh, Jesus. Okay, so let's uh, get the second question. Okay, so first I want to say Wait, thank you. Wants an yeah, yeah, they want to do them both. Feel free oh, if you want to give the answer first or yeah. if you want. No, no, go ahead. What? We'll do it, it's fine. Sure, they're similar in, in essence. Um, so first I want to say thank you to the wonderful panel. It's so heart for, heartwarming uh, to see such a, a venerable tribute. Um, Let's see. I, I find her work, uh, Tony's work, to be so inspirational uh, in so many ways, and that she persevered, and that uh, she was so much a strong advocate for the Puerto Rican community. Uh, the question that I have is, um, how did she actually set about helping the Puerto Rican community? That's the question. Thank you. Wow. So uh, very fast because we don't have a lot of time. So um, in terms of the the cultural exchange which is now continued in some ways by Comité Noviembre. You know, when Tony started Aspira, she used to have Puerto Rican history classes. She had art in, uh, and I met one of the artists who actually was teaching the, the young people art. So it, it was always there, you know, the art and the culture. Um, the cultural part I wanna just say is that, you know, her family instilled in her, uh, her grandmother and grandfather instilled in her these working class eth ethics and values. Mm -hmm. And she institutionalized them into the organizations that she organized. 
And they're the same values that I grew up with. Honesty, perseverance, you're ethical, you try to be respectful, you do hard work, you do the best that you can. My father always used to say, which Tony used to say in a different way, you know, you could clean toilets, but you're going to be the best toilet cleaner there is. And I would say like, okay, all right, if you say so. So um, Aspira actually did bring students for many years to Puerto Rico. And she actually, uh, you know, had these sessions where the different political parties would make presentations to the students. Mm -hmm. And so some of the students got very politicized through those experiences. I'm not sure if Aspira um, uh, continues to do that, but I know that Comité Noviembre has done that. How she started to help the Puerto Rican community, there was an 85%, I want to say this twice, there was an 85, because I get so pissed off, 85% dropout rate of Puerto Ricans in New York. Yeah. And that's a, a, a figure she always said. The other thing is they were classes for retarded mental development. And Puerto Ricans who did not speak English were put in those classes because they couldn't speak English. And that really did damage an enormous number of, of children. I found one guy who won a Pulitzer for photography from the New York Times. And he had been in those CRMD classes all throughout elementary, middle, and high school. And I said to him, how did it have an impact on you? And he said, I'm still doubting myself. He said, look, I've accomplished all of this, but there are moments when I doubt myself. So she saw the damage that was being done. And in the film, she says, you know, when you want to segregate them, which was the CRMD classes, it's okay. When we want them to be empowered, and that's why we bring them together, you say that that's discrimination, that yeah. we're segregating them. And so she was pretty clear, you know, she would see what was going on in the community. And there was a break there when she was in her bohemian period. She worked in this uh, place on 110th Street, which I can't remember the name now. She worked at this place on 110th Street, and there she was like faced with all this Puerto Rican community that had all these issues and nobody, well, virtually nobody was doing anything about it. So she said in her head, I'm going to get the people that I'm working with, which was her little higher people, we're going to start to work on this. And that's how, how she started to organize the young people because she said, we need leaders and you know they're going to go to college and in four years, they're going to be leaders. And that's actually the case. So she really did get to know the Puerto Rican community and really did uh, create mechanisms for the for the Puerto Rican community to help itself. There were people, I have to say this to be fair, there were people who were already doing that. Hilberto Gerena Valentin, who was a labor organizer, Evelyn Antonetti, other people, many Diaz, they used to go out to the airport and they would have these tables set up and people would come and they would say, where are you from? And they would say, oh, I'm from Cabo Rojo. And they would say, oh, the people from Cabo Rojo live here. Here, get this name and number, contact them. They're going to find you an apartment and they're going to help you find a job. And that's what they did. They formed El Congreso del Pueblo, which was all of those hometown clubs. I don't know, maybe the older folks remember the hometown clubs. Um, and then they formed this group. Okay, fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, just, I, mean, I, I feel I just so glad. I feel I'm so okay. blessed that I that they were, you know, that I was in the midst of all of them. Yeah, okay. All of them, you know, they were all my mentors. Good. Yes. I just want to correct. I was not involved in that planning you spoke of. That was Asida. Yeah, that was Asida. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um. <laughs> Krista, before, uh, I wonder if you have time for one more question from the audience, because this gentleman has been wanting to uh, oh. say something for a while now. Luis. Sorry. I'm honored to be here as a, a former, uh, not aspirante student, but a worker at, in Aspida, and today uh, uh, on the Board of Regents for the state of New York. Yeah. I say that because Aspida was about leadership development. And I wonder in that part of, of the work, what Tony, uh, Dr. Pantoja did to work more closely with people like uh, Cesar Chavez and others yeah. in the other Latin American communities to develop leadership and to develop a coalition building. When she did the uh, Universidad 41, when she developed the Universidad Boricua, now Boricua College, that's her, that was her doctoral dissertation project. In the planning of that, while she was a student at Union, there were a number of people from different communities, Black, Chicano, Native American, 
And together, they were all building alternative educational community-based schools of higher education in their communities. So she was influenced by all of that. And she also influenced them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I give two shout outs? I wanna give two shout outs, I'm sorry. I talk too much. Um, uh, my day Hunkos was very humble and she didn't say that she was one of the volunteers that helped to create the mural of Antonia Pantoja on 116th Street between 1st and 2nd Avenue. The second thing is that Nidia Edgecombe is here and she is the person who uh, compelled me to create the Antonia Pantoja Centennial. So I want to give props yeah. to her. And she was the person who organized the Evelina Antonetti Centennial of 100 years. Uh, and so, you know, and Aspida was an active member and is an active member of the uh, Centennial. Um, and um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> I have a couple questions from the I have a couple questions from the Zoom audience. Um, okay. they've been really engaged and have been really um excited with the conversation. One of them is touching a little bit on what was just mentioned. Um and she is curious to hear about intra Latinx connections with Cubans, Latinx, and other Latinx diaspora people. How did Dr. Pantoja write or think about building this coalition in which she connected to a Latina lesbian community? in New York. Um, mm -hmm. Additionally, somebody is asking also about how she would feel about the increase of migrants coming into the United States, particularly um, to New York and how they're currently being treated. Thank you. Yes, yeah, she, um, <laughs> <as far, laughs> she was not in, involved in any public way with any lesbian group during her lifetime. Hmm? Oh, the like asylum, yeah, the migrant. The next so, you know, Tony was a, an advocate for human rights and Tony was a lifelong learner. And so, um, you know, whenever she saw an injustice, she would say, no, 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 we have to do something about that. I mean, that was really her, her, her sort of mantra. We have to do something about that. So I, I'm sure that she would have been absolutely opposed to the treatment of uh, not just the asylum, uh, folks, but to all of the immigrants that are coming in, whether they're documented or undocumented, because we're facing a wave of xenophobia like we haven't seen in, you know, since the beginning of this country, I yeah. think, when, you know, the immigrants started to really come in and uh, Italians weren't white and Irish weren't white, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so I think it's really important. And she was really, uh, you know, against uh, um, racism and faced it in Puerto Rico. And I want to say this because I think it's really important for us to acknowledge that for those of us who are light skinned, and have white skin privilege, we have to open up the doors for folks who don't have those privileges. And we have to let white folks know that they have privileges and that they have to become allies. Yeah. And I, I think we, we talked a little bit about her involvement with Nicaragua, with Cuba, with Chicanos. Uh, we mentioned that in her work, she was very much connected to different movements and, and the Filipinos. African-American. Okay. All right, I, I think we are out of time, unfortunately. I know there's one more question, but um, we have to go. So um, thank you all for for being here. Thank you for being a wonderful audience. Thank you to my uh, to the panel members. Thank you. Thank you. Home safe, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.